Hey, Walter Sorrells back with another Knife Makers Friday Five. Today, some lessons about learning in another guy's shop. So I hope you had a chance to watch a couple of videos that I did last week. Basically, I went out to Pop's Knife Supply where one of the owners, jo Joey Berry, um, taught me how he made a knife. And it wasn't just me kind of standing there watching him diddle around in the shop. He actually made an entire knife and I followed along. He would make his part and then I would make, I would do the exact same thing. So it was back and forth me doing exactly what he did. It was really just a super experience. Uh, link in the cards and descriptions in case you missed that. Anyway, this week I wanna do a sort of debrief on that whole experience and show some specific things that I learned that I didn't really have time to talk about in the video, as well as sharing some thoughts about the value of learning from other makers, especially working in their own shops with them. So one of the kind of interesting things about making these videos is that you know, if you're actually watching them, you might think, well, oh, okay, so that's the way Walter makes a knife. And uh, the truth is that if I'm for real making a, a knife, um, I'm almost invariably going to do it quite differently from the way that I show it in the video. Just as a, for instance, uh, you know, if I'm making a knife, I don't use patterns or templates, which is kind of the approach that Joey uses. Uh, I don't use drill guides, any of that stuff. I've got a digital readout back there on my mill. And so that's a really accurate, reproducible, and reasonably fast way of making handles. You can just slap them in there, burnk, 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 and you're watching the digital readout and everything's good to a thousandth of an inch. But I don't like showing that in videos because you know, 99% of the people who watch these videos don't have a mill with a DRO. So I try to do stuff that somebody can follow along with. And one of the kind of um, funny aspects of that is that sometimes I'm doing stuff that, um, you know, I don't actually think is the best way of doing it. It's always stuff that works, but it's not necessarily my go-to approach. Obviously, I'm not trying to mislead people. I'm just trying to show you know, a lot of different ways of doing stuff. And so if you watch 10 of my videos, you might see me making handles 10 different ways. Okay, so let me dig into some of the details first. This tiny little insignificant thing uh, was, I felt like one of the best little lessons that I got out there uh, at Joey's shop. For years, I've been using locator pins that I just kind of dredged up in the moment as I was making something. Uh, here's one right here. So. If you're uh, you know, new to this stuff, uh, when you make a handle, it's really important that all the holes line up, both for the handle itself, but for the scales. and you know, All the holes have to be in the same place, that's, that's the point. So if you drill them on a drill press, or even with a hand drill, locator pins are really crucial. If you don't use a locator pin, it's almost impossible to get the holes to all line up. I'm not saying it can't be done, but this is a better way of doing it. So anyway, I've been using these little just chunks that uh, I chop off of things on a kind of ad hoc basis, and they're always doing that. They fall on the floor, and then they're gone, and even if they work, sometimes they're a little too big. I use different pieces of stock. Sometimes they're too short or too long. Sometimes they're too fat, and it's hard to get them in the hole, and then you gotta hammer them through. Sometimes then you have to, hammer them back out, and anyway, it's a big pain in the neck. What they use out at Pops are locator pins that are made just a hair undersized, so they're gonna fit in every single hole, and they got a cap on the, on the uh, or a handle, or whatever you wanna call it, on the pin, and that way, when you put it in, it goes in easily, it doesn't fall out, take it back out, and then it's easy, you know, it doesn't fall on the floor as easily. So once I got back to my shop, I drilled four holes in uh, this little piece of wood here, and I, uh, I made four of these little pins. I'm gonna stick them in here, and they're gonna be there every single time I need a locator pin. So that alone made it worth the drive out to uh, Brazelton to uh, hang out in Joey's shop. The idea seems kind of obvious once you see it, but I've never actually seen anybody using these before. I imagine somebody probably does, but I just haven't seen them. You know, the, the thing about basically all craft is that you're building out of little insignificant small steps 
and good craftsmanship is not some magical thing, it's a bunch of little tiny, tiny, tiny steps. And what makes good craftsmen better than crummy craftsmen is that they, do, they know more steps and they do each one of those steps better. Another cool technique that I uh, picked up out at Joey's, um, when he's drilling scales, Joey sticks the scales together back to back with a couple dabs of super glue, and then he drills the holes, and then he just pops them apart, and they're ready to go. Now, I used a kind of variant of this technique, minus the super glue, like 20 years ago. And back then, I mean, I did not know what I was doing. Just so many aspects of technique that I just didn't really understand, including how to drill things well. So back then, I was using a lot of eighth inch holes. I was using Corby pins. Sometimes I was even doing 16 inch, 16th of an inch holes. And the, this, this technique of putting stuff back to back and drilling through the backside did not work because the pins, I mean, the drill bits would wander and then they would go off. And so even though they started in the right place, they would head off in the wrong direction. This is something that the skinnier a drill bit is, the more likely it is to do it. Anyway, bottom line is I abandoned that kind of approach a long, long time ago and kind of forgot about it. Well, Joey, you know, does this every day and he's got it down to a science and he's almost always doing quarter inch holes. And uh, a quarter inch drill bit is much more rigid than say eighth or especially 16th inch uh, uh, drills. And so they drill nice and straight. They come out in the perfect location. It's a really, really nice technique. And, um, I was super stoked to, uh, to see how he did it, especially the little super glue detail, really neat little detail. And it really makes it easy to get those holes lined up when you're just using a drill press. All right, quick timeout. If you've been enjoying all the free content I've been offering on YouTube for the past 15 years, yes, you heard that right. And you wanna give back to the channel, there's a way. It's called Patreon. All my Patreon supporters at any pledge level get plans to most of my builds while some other bonuses at higher pledge levels, plus the good feeling of helping out the channel. So help us help you. Link in the cards and description. Thanks, and now back to work. Okay, so yet another really useful thing that I got from watching Joey was the way that he finishes his knives. A lot of this comes down to belt selection. Um, if you actually sell the knives that you make, you'll know that finishing knives is really where the money is. Hand sanding, for instance, you know, if you're just making a pretty simple, well, I don't have one right here anyway, but, you know, a knife this size, hand sanding that might take three or four hours. And that could potentially double, even triple the price that you have to ask for that knife in order to pay for the work that you put into it. So coming up with efficient, practical, good looking finishing techniques is a big, big deal for knife makers who, you don't have to be you know, a professional knife maker if you just wanna sell a few knives to your friends or sell them at crafts fairs or something like that every now and then. It really behooves you to come up with a reasonable, efficient, good way of putting a nice finish on a knife. And Joey has totally got that down to a science. So his approach basically comes down to using surface conditioning belts. Produces a really nice, clean, even finish. So if you haven't tried it, uh, check out the video, watch what I did, and then try it yourself. Interestingly, it doesn't, that technique doesn't so much help me in most of the kinds of knives that I typically sell. Um, I'm not gonna go down the rabbit hole of explaining why, but you know, this is one of the really fascinating aspects of learning um, new techniques in, in knife making is that they, they sometimes have to dovetail with a whole bunch of other things that you do in order for that particular technique to work for you. And this is, you know, one of those things that if you watch a lot of uh, knife makers videos on whatever, YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, or whatever, a lot of times people show little techniques or details of how they do things. And sometimes they're like, oh, this is the way you gotta do it. And a great many times, the reason that that makes sense for them is because they have a whole system that, that functions correctly in. And it really, it might be the cherry on the, the 
you know, the ice cream of their particular way of making a knife, and then you take it back to your shop and it doesn't work at all. So there's no reason to be concerned about that, but it's just something to be aware of when you learn new techniques from people. So one of the main lessons in all this is that you have to go out and try and find new um, techniques and ways of doing stuff, but then you have to bring them back to your shop, experiment, and find out what works for you. Something that works great for somebody else may not be perfect for you. So one of the really cool things for me, you know, I've been associated with Pops now for about a year, uh, and it's been super productive for me. It's been really, really useful because one of the things that when you're running a knife making supply shop that you have to do is you have to be aware of all kinds of gear that's out there, all kinds of gizmos and all that sort of thing. So they're constantly trying out new kinds of abrasives, new belts, different brands of this and all that. And so I sort of get to piggyback off of their experience with all these different kinds of belts. And so in Joey's case, you know, he's got this just really sweet technique of getting a very even finish using surface conditioning belts. So, you know, I always tell people when it comes to belt grinders, everybody's doing different stuff try out lots and lots of different belts. You know, you may try some new belt and all of a sudden that just totally solves some problem you've been having for a long time. When I got started, there just weren't that many belts available out there. I mean, not that there weren't, you know, different kinds of abrasives, but I mean, now there are just so many different kinds, different backings, different um, types of abrasive. They break down different ways, surface conditioning belts, all these different things and trying all those things out really helps you find stuff that works in your shop. So not to get too philosophical here, but my trip up there really helped me realize or you know, reinforce to me just how much of a prisoner of a particular approach or philosophy or material or whatever it is um, that you can be. In this particular case, that was really reinforced to me about how I make handles. I made two knives for the video. I did one last week and then one at Pops. And uh, the one that I did in the video, I made back in my shop. And I really, if you just look at them, if, if you just saw two pictures of them, they don't look all that different. But if you feel them, they actually feel quite different. And what I was trying to do as I was up there was follow along with how Joey was making his handles and it wasn't entirely sinking in that first time. You know, I'd look at what I got and then how he did it and I was like, ah, I'm not quite hitting the mark. But once I'd gone through the whole process and seen what my result was, I was able to come back to my shop and I think the second time around, I hit it a lot closer. and. So, you know, kind of my general point here is that a lot of these craft things take a long time to sink in. You have to get an idea in your mind and then aim for that idea and figure out the techniques that are necessary to get there. A lot of times the techniques are actually not as important as just understanding what it is that you're aiming for. I mean, a really good example of this is in Japanese swords, the tip uh, on katanas of a particular type of geometry, this, the, the type that you see most, which is called shinogi zakuri, it's very geometrically complicated. And you can see a thousand pictures of them, and you, you, do, you still don't really understand how they work. But if you see somebody make one and you get to examine it from a whole bunch of different directions, all of a sudden you understand, oh, that's the geometry I'm aiming for. And once you get that, it makes the whole process easier. So getting back to this whole issue of going to somebody else's shop, the benefit that I had of going up and watching Joey go through this whole process was after seeing it and kind of seeing how I sort of missed the mark on my first attempt, it really helped me understand better what I was aiming for. You know, I've seen a million pictures of knives or picked them up at knife shows that had these kind of handle designs, but it's just, it's not the kind of thing that I typically make and it's not the tip kind of thing that I typically use. And as a result, I just didn't have that intuitive sense, like a clear idea in my mind of what I was aiming for. And once I was able to watch him do it, get that idea in my mind, 
whole thing started to fall in place. So to kind of wrap this up, this gave me an opportunity to really kind of think about you know, how I've gone about learning to be a knife maker. And I realized, uh, you know, I've spent a fair amount of time in other people's shops, but it's almost always in one of two contexts. One is sort of a hammer-ins and things like that where people are sort of making um, presentations and they're trying to condense really complicated things into a one hour time slot or that sort of thing. So they have to leave out a lot of details. By going to Joey's shop and seeing little tiny things that they did there and, and watching an entire knife be made, you know, I was able to see a lot of these interesting little details that, I mean, I've been up at, watched guys doing stuff up at Pops many times. But I didn't, you know, I never noticed this little gizmo right here, this little, you know, this little pin. Um, so going someplace and actually, you know, making a knife there, uh, it's just a, it's a different experience from just going and hanging out. I mean, another thing that happens, especially once you sort of learn some stuff about knife making, is a lot of times you'll go to another person's shop and you say, oh, I got this cool little gizmo. And the other person says, hey, let me show you this little thing that I did. And you're not working your way all the way through a particular project. It's a lot of little piecemeal stuff, which is great. But sometimes these little, again, I, I keep coming back to this little pin, but it just seems like a super insignificant thing. But it's like, oh, that's just genius. And the best way to pick that kind of thing up is have somebody just guide you through exactly how they make a knife. And just to pursue that a little bit, if you have the opportunity to take lessons directly from a knife maker, a uh, great way to pick things up. There's so much stuff that's on the internet where people kind of have to leave things out, not necessarily because they're hiding the weenie about something, it's just that you've got 10 minutes or 15 minutes or whatever to show a big project, and so you just have to leave some things out. Okay, so final, final point here is, it's real easy to learn a certain amount of stuff and then to kind of be defensive about it. I don't mean emotionally, it's just like you get nailed into your little area and you stop learning. We're all subject to this and so I highly recommend everybody just getting out there and trying to learn new stuff, not just off of videos, but going to other people's shops and, and seeing how they do what they do. And there are really two, two aspects of learning. I mean, the first thing about learning is that it makes you a better knife maker. But the second thing is that when you stop learning, it's not just that you don't reach your full potential as a knife maker, it's just plain boring. All right, guys, thanks for watching. I hope you picked up a few things and uh, we'll see you soon. Keep on making those knives. Thanks for watching guys. If you like what we're doing here, please subscribe and make sure that you click on that bell so you get notified of all the latest videos. Want to buy a knife from me? Check out my modern blades at tacticsarmory.com. Digging the channel? You can support our video making efforts on Patreon. You know, I've been banging away on these videos for like 10 years. So I hope you'll show some love for all that hard work. Link in the cards and descriptions. Finally, if you're interested in making Japanese swords, check out my full line of Japanese sword videos where I show how to forge Japanese swords as well as how to polish them and how to make fittings, handles, and scabbards. WalterSorrelsBlades.com